It was the end of the summer when I was four years old, and I was spending the afternoons lying in the sun, sorting out all the knowledge I'd gained. I was preparing for kindergarten. And I thought I'd better have myself sorted out. And I figured out there was like three major boxes in your mind where information goes. There's stuff that goes in that's true. Like if you touch a hot stove, you might get burned. That's true. And you gotta be careful, that's true. And there was stuff people believed. Like I remember someone saying, no way a lady can fly an airplane. I just don't believe that. So that, and then there was this other stuff that was like, what? Excuse me? You gotta be kidding me. A whole lot of stuff that just was silly. I come from a small Michigan town and there was a, attempts at suburbs. I mean, this is a small town. There were two spreads of 20 houses. That was the suburb. And next to us was a large family of Catholic girls and another Catholic family and a Muslim family and a Muslim family and a Wasp family and a Jewish family and an Orthodox Greek family and a Jewish family and the very drunken alcoholic car dealer and his wife who gambled and smoked and us. And I was the youngest child of all these people who had very large families and all of these children were always saying things. Like once in the sandbox when I was three, the neighbor who was seven says, you know when your grandma dies, she's gonna spin in hell in purgatory forever. Well, I'm three, and I think spinning's cool. She goes, no, 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 it's tied to a spit, and she's going to be over a fire. It's like, you don't know my grandma. What'd you say? That's the kind of stuff that went in there. But I'm hearing this from everybody, and I'm going off to school, and the adults and all the other people, you've know, you got to put stuff that they've put in the belief bag, which I've tossed over in the, in the truth bag. And it was causing this pressure. I couldn't, it was something against myself. It's okay, you can believe that, but I'm not going to tell myself it's true. And I'm lying there one day, and I remember my mother saying, when I was quite young, never do anything that goes against yourself. Because you have to live with that the rest of your life. You will always know what it is that you did, if it was good or if it wasn't. And so I'm lying there, and I went, that's it. All these people that are 5 and 6 and 10 and 12, and all the adults in my childhood that have chosen some belief and crammed it in a, tooth, a truth box in their head, I said, I just won't do it. And all that pressure and anxiety just like disappeared. And I stood up, I was like, whoa. That was easy. That's it. And I was happy. And now I got ready for kindergarten. Of course, I'm four years old. I think every four-year-old in the world has figured the same thing out, right? And it's like everybody older kind of feels sorry for them. They're going to suffer. But, you know, anyway. When I got to school, I found out kids younger than myself had already put things in the belief bag into truth and kept my mouth shut for a very long time. Now, it was 30 years ago, almost this week, and a really heavy snowstorm was killing New York City. And I had to get to Denver in a family emergency. Now, I was supposed to leave from LaGuardia, but when I got there, the airport was closed, and I hustled a cab, got to Kennedy, and that airport was closed, and the airlines put a bunch of us that were desperate to get out on a bus to Newark, and luckily, I, I got out on one of the last planes before it was all shut down. You see, my mother had been living in Aspen. And earlier that morning, she was skiing down from the top of the mountain. And it was somewhere near the very top that she hit a tree. And when she passed that tree, she left a third of her brain behind, and she fell into the snow. No one knows how long she was there. It was near the top. One of the helicopter crew that rescued her, he said, you know, it's that top of the mountain snow kept that lady alive. And this is kind of cool. When I got to the hospital, Late that night, I found my entire family already there. And they're all sitting with this collective, like, death mask on their face. And it takes a really long time for anybody to recognize that we're in a family crisis, because in our family, you keep things, you know, really tight to the vest, you know, uptight, white, wasp, and cold. So I went into the room where my mom lay. What I saw was not my mom. My mom had been a beautiful singer and a showgirl who gave up her dream to move to the suburbs and raise her children and re realize that American dream. She was Mary Tyler Moore as Laura Petrie in the Dick Van Dyke show, The Showgirl Suburban Mom. That was my mom. This was an unrecognizable mass of broken bone and flesh. And I sat down in the only chair in that room and began to think. And you start sorting back in time all the things you've learned. I'm 28 years old, and this is my mother. I know a long time went by because the nurses kept saying, you know, you need to get some rest and get some food. 
I eventually did. I got some food and came back and sat and thought some more. And then sometime later on, I couldn't think of anything else. And so I said, well, I guess I should talk to my mom. I said, Mom, you don't have to feel bad about anything. The way things turned out between you and Dad, that was really for the better. And I said, Mom, you don't have to feel bad about the way Dad treated me. I'm really going to be OK. And up out of nowhere, I still to this day, 30 years later, don't know where it came from, but up out of my gut, and I said, and Mom, you don't have to feel bad about anything about your dad. And she opened her eyes, and she sat up, what did you say? And the alarms are going off, I'm standing up, you're here, you're here. And the nurse comes running, and she lays just like she did. And the nurse goes, honey, you fall asleep and step on a wire. And I said, no, she rose, she spoke, she's here. Oh, baby, you need some rest. It's just a matter of time. This lady's skull is crushed. Her spine is broken. You just, you need to get some rest. Well, I did, because I knew my mom was there. When I came back the next morning, I found my entire family again assembled, but this time I was outside the operating room, and they had this death look on their face. And I'm like, Mom's here. And it was late that afternoon, the junior most surgeon came out, and she said, you know, this lady's going to live. She's going to live. But when she comes out, she's going to be in a coma. And if she ever comes out of that, she will at best, at best, sit in a wheelchair and drool all over herself the rest of her life. Now, before those words could even hit the ground, my family spread back across the countryside to their homes, and there I was with my mom. I was the one that was cast as the family caretaker. It was natural. It's what you do. And for the next several months, I was between my mother and the doctor, my mother and the nurse, my mother and the therapist. What are you doing? Why are you guys doing that? They'd say, why do you want to know? And I'd say, if I'm going to do this the rest of my life, I should learn from you, the professionals, now, not wonder what to do when it's time to go home. And I said, that's a good answer. And that was fine all the time that my mother was in a coma. Now, when you're in a coma in a hospital, someone has to be there, a family member, to do everything for you. Because you go to breakfast, you go to class, you go to exercise, you go to the movie, you go to makeup, you do everything, even though you're in a coma. You do stuff. It's when my mom started to come out of the coma that things changed. Now, TV and, and, and Hollywood and, and entertainment have taught us that when you come out of coma, it's like, hi, here I am. But it's not like that. There's a period of awakening. It's a gray area. It's, it's like infancy. It's called semi-comatose state. It couldn't be any more simple than that. But it's, and it can last from a few hours to the entire rest of your lifetime. And you're there. But you, your personality, you are not there. You're like an infant. And that's when these people showed up, these volunteers, some very self-righteous, born-again Christians. And they did their damnedest at this time to interject themselves and their Jesus into my mother, which really caused a problem, because that's not who my mother is. And so I had to start to fight to keep them out. And they would, I would go get my lunch, they would scurry in and do something, and I would do, and it's sort of constantly like, you know, shooing away the bees. And one time my mom came back from having a surgery. There was a lot of surgeries to replace the piss, missing piece of bone, which is bigger than my hand. And she kept rejecting it. And they shave your head, and they do the whole surgery. And one time I came in, and they're all on their knees, and they're praying. And the ringleader's got my mom's hand on a Bible. And it's like, what's going on here? Well, she asked us to pray for her. I don't think that's what my mom would do. So I went over, took my mom's hand off the Bible, and I said, Mom, what's going on here? She's not really talking yet. Her language at this stage is <laughs> I don't think she asked you to pray for her. And she, oh, yes, we all heard her. And my mom looked up at the woman, the little self-righteous bleach bonnet, and she reached up and she grabbed the woman by there and she yanked really far and she goes, where's my fur? She wants to know where her hair is, ladies. They left. And it became this intense attack. Intense. This is the mid-80s. It's Colorado. This is born-again Christians are really strong. <laughs> and one time again, months later, my mom has another surgery and for the missing plate. And I come back, and there she is sitting with a turban on her head. Just, all these months, there's been no turban. Where does this come from? And I hear from the door of the room, I put that on her. And it was the little belligerent ringleader of the born-agains. I put that on her because she's ashamed. 
She's ashamed of being brain damaged. She's ashamed of her head being shaved for surgery. She's ashamed she has to recover. That's why that's on her. And I took it off my mom and put it in the trash and said, shame on you. Shame on you. There's no shame in recovery. There's no shame in being hurt. There's no shame. Everybody here is brain damaged. And Laura, my mom's roommate, this beautiful Mexican girl, who was the same age as I, whose husband tried to murder her by repeatedly bashing her head with a fire stick poker, had had the same failed replacement surgery that morning and took her one good hand, which seemed an eternity, but was probably no more than 10 seconds, and got that thumb up under there and flicked hers off and went, thanks, Rick. And Laura's mother and I pushed our brain damaged patients down the hallway, and the bevy of them started to gather as we went to the cafeteria because we were late. Everyone is getting ready for lunch. And by the time we get to the door of the cafeteria, there's about 40 of the volunteers and the therapists and the whole group of people in this hospital that are part of this born-again Christian concept of wellness. And pushing the cafeteria, and Ron, this nine-year-old boy, a farmer whose a tractor crushed his skull. Hey, look, Nancy ain't wearing no turban. That's right, Ron. Did you ever see her wear anything before? No. Why not? There's no shame in having your head shaved, having surgery. You all get it. We went right on the table, one by one, everybody taking off their decorations of shame. And I'm told to this day, I haven't been there, but that they no longer wear decorations of shame in the brain damage unit at the hospital in Englewood, Colorado. I'm very happy about that. And it was by that act that the hospital higher up said for the born against to stay away from my mom. That was great. It was great. The reason it was a problem was is that my mom is at a point in her life where she has to find herself again. She's 50 years old. She doesn't know. Lipstick goes on here, you know, and, and life is just a whole new discovery. And it's like, how dare they interject something on someone who has to find herself again? It was a problem. The problem is, you see, my mother does believe in Jesus, but she never went to church a day in her life. She never prayed with anybody. That was her own personal internal space. And I felt it was important that she be allowed to find that again. She lived with me in New York 10 years. She learned to drive to Manhattan in one day. My mom's lived in her own 21 years. She's done extraordinarily well. And I'm convinced it's because at that very fragile time, we were able to keep belief over here in things that were true where they belong. And I knew that what they were doing was against herself. She did come back to herself. She lived with me downtown. I watched her. She was a rebellious teen. She would sneak black men up the back door. She became my mom again. We were at a family outing about 15 years after her accident, and a woman came who we'd never met, the mother of one of my brother's friends, my brother's friend, the drug dealer, the, the big problem child, and she was from North Dakota. And she came up and wanted to meet my mom. And we'd known this about this woman for all our lives, but here we are meeting her. And she says, Nancy, I wanted you to know that the only reason you got well from your brain damage is that my prayer circle in North Dakota prayed for you. My mother went like this. And went in the house. I want to slap that lady. And I didn't. I followed my mom. And she's sitting on the couch in this glass tin porch and just about to cry. And I said, Mom, what's the matter? I did it myself. 